Hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of Pod and Market, Newark's first and so far only discussion podcast. I'm your host, Manny Antunes. Because this is our first episode, I would like to take a little time to explain the origins of the podcast and its purpose before we delve into the discussion we have planned for today. Just bear with me for a few moments as I lay out this podcast. I promise I'll keep it short. So what is the Pod and Market podcast? What's with the name? Why should you even listen to us? This podcast is meant to be a discussion, a place where people who have a stake in the city of Newark can come and discuss what's affecting the city, new developments occurring within it, and the history and culture of this little corner of the world. Here we will hash out points of conflict and disagreement. We will attempt to exercise the old ghosts that haunt this place, confront its new demons, and celebrate the things that enrich the lives of the people who work, live, and play here. That being said, this podcast is meant to be a discussion. Issues will be fleshed out, and things can get a little heated. The last thing I want is everyone agreeing all the time. We want disagreement on this show. It's only through disagreement, I believe, that we can suss out the truth and see all sides of an issue. I really hope that our guests and our listeners, even if they don't agree with the other side, can learn something from each other. I will keep this civil. No one will be allowed to attack the participants of this podcast personally or question their motives absent evidence to the contrary. On a similar note, this is not meant to be a bunch of talking heads yelling about the president or Congress or whatever politician du jour, like you see on CNN or Fox News. I will shut down this podcast if that happens. So why the name? Broad and Market is a shibboleth, something that makes sense to a lot of those who live in Newark, but not much sense to those outside of it. Those three words mean a whole world to Newarkers, beyond just that intersection. Broad and Market is the spiritual center of Newark, its solar plexus, its beating heart. Broader Market is a giant form of commerce and interchange. There isn't a person alive in the city who hasn't visited that intersection at some point in their life. Just saying those words conjures up a specific image of controlled chaos, free expression, and metaphorical interchange. More important, that intersection lives and breathes the history of the city. Broad, which runs north to south, and which you could technically ride all the way to Trenton, stands for the entire state of New Jersey, its history and its diversity. Market, which runs east to west, represents the old and the new world, new hopes and new beginnings. I want this podcast to be your oral broad and market. So who am I? Why should you listen to me? Actually, there is no particular reason why you should listen to me. Instead, over these episodes, I hope to build some trust with you. I hope that the direction and discussion of this podcast will show you the earnestness I bring to this mission and the seriousness I bring to the issues and the discussion. As to my backstory, I'm a lifelong Newarker. I grew up on 11th Street in the North Ward, a few blocks away from Calandra's Bakery and Newark School Stadium. For nine years of my life, I attended First Avenue Elementary in the old building right across from School Stadium. I have my mom to thank for my first introduction to Newark state and national politics. In the early 2000s, we fought to prevent an old Coca-Cola bottling plant from becoming 43 family houses, which would have put additional burdens on our already overcrowded school. This fight took me to City Hall in Newark to the Department of Education in Trenton, to a youth leadership conference in Chicago, to a national conference in DC. Amazingly, we won that fight. That victory stands today as the new First Avenue School on Bloomfield and First Avenue. In the seventh grade, I was accepted into the Y Foundation. I was, it was through that foundation I attended boarding school in Southern Massachusetts, Tabor Academy, still near to my heart. Four years later, I was accepted at the college at Harvard University, where I majored in history and minored in German. After spending these eight years abroad, I returned home to Newark and was a high school history teacher. I taught at both at Eastside High and Technology High. These years teaching were super important to me. I'm still friends with many of my students and caused me to reorient my life to permanently staying in the city once I settled on a career. After teaching, I went to law school in New York City and came straight back here to begin my legal career. That's basically me in a nutshell. I'm sure on future podcasts you'll hear more about specific stories from me about growing up here. Otherwise, there's not much more to go into except the format. 90% of the show will be a discussion on one particular issue. Issues will range from as general as gentrification to as narrow as the building of a single building. Once the discussion winds down, I will ask each of the participants to share something they are excited or happy about in Newark, whether it is related to the discussion or not. Without further ado, let me introduce today's subjects and participants. In October of 2017, the Newark City Council adopted an ordinance amending the Newark Zoning and Land Use Regulations, establishing a type of zone within the city's master plan known as MX3. This new area, located right outside of Penn Station in the Ironbound, 
would now allow for buildings of up to 20 stories in height, up from the previous restriction of eight stories. The variance was not without controversy. Many people and groups showed up to the council meetings to protest and make their opposition to the variance known. One of the groups of residents went so far as to file a lawsuit against the city council, saying it violated the city's master plan rules as well as notice requirements under state law. A state judge ruled in favor of the residents. A few weeks ago on January 9th, the city council revisited the issue and voted in favor of going forward with creating the zone with the higher height restrictions. To discuss MX3, its ramifications, its repercussions, and its future are Lillian Rivero. Lillian is an activist, artist, and community organizer, born and raised in the ironbound Newark with a long history of fighting for social justice and with national um, grassroots and community organizations. She has been fighting MX3 for over a year with residents of her neighborhood and the Ironbound Community Corporation and was the lead organizer of Newark at Intersections, who is the Renaissance Four, a curated art exhibition including film document documentaries and performances throughout the Newark community. Summer of fall of 2017 at Lips with co-curate Daniel Joseph and other Newark artists. Lisa Scorsolini, Lisa is a founding member of PL Plan Newark and currently serves as its treasurer. She is a practicing municipal attorney and has been a resident of the Ironbound since 2004. Drew Curtis. Drew is with the Ironbound Community Corporation, which is a 50-year-old community-based organization delivering early childhood education, youth development programs, family services, and workforce development programs, as well as environmental justice and community development initiatives, in line with the stated principles of ju justice and equality. So first I'm going to ask Lisa, Lisa just to go into the, um, the litigation that sort of put a pause on the, um, or initially put a pause on the um, variance on the height restrictions. Sure, good morning. Um, so as you previously stated, in uh, 2017, the city passed the what I call round one of the MX3 ordinance. A group of citizens led by Plan Newark filed a complaint in lieu of prerogative writ against the city council, the planning board, and the city clerk. That complaint had four counts to it. One was a notice requirement. But in particular, one of the buildings in the zone was left off of the notice list, and therefore the residents and the association, the condominium association, did not receive notice that is required under the municipal land use law. The second count was a challenge to the substance of the ordinance itself, basically that it was inconsistent with the master plan, and therefore it would be invalid also a requirement under the municipal land use law. The third count was um, alleging that there was spot zoning, that this ordinance was basically crafted and adopted to benefit certain landowners and not the community. And that is basically in response to the overwhelming community opposition, all of the residents and the property owners that showed up at the community meetings that the city held prior to the adoption of the ordinance. And the fourth count was on due process grounds against the planning board because the planning board at one of their hearings did not allow citizens to speak in opposition to the ordinance. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, after some um, months of uh, attempting to gain discovery against the city, the um, plaintiffs filed a summary judgment motion. The city responded based on procedural grounds saying that it wasn't proper for that type of cause of action, meaning summary judgment wasn't proper, but did not really respond substantively to the complaint or to the claims in the summary judgment motion. So the judge ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, basically making the ordinance void ab initio, meaning from inception, so that any applications that may have been approved in the interim would then become invalid. Um, so now the plaintiffs, or at least some of the individuals who originally were part of the first round lawsuit, are currently contemplating whether to sue the city again. And so what happened on January 9th? Because that's, I think, confusing to a lot of people. You had a lawsuit. You seem to have won, but the city council came back and voted for this variance? Or Well, it's an ordinance. Ordinance, um, sorry. Yeah, so they did. Uh, they made some modifications. Um, as you said, the round one MX3 ordinance had a height um, allowance up to 20 stories, which may or may not have been a loophole, may or may not be have been an inadvertent mistake. Either way that was corrected in round two. So now the current height restriction would be 12 stories down from 20. They also this time um, sat, you know, uh, 
made good on the notice requirements. They were sure to notice the building that had previously been omitted. But the uh, most important thing to consider is that this time the city council acknowledged that it was inconsistent with the master plan. And under the municipal land use law, they have to state their reasons why. And the reasons that they stated were basically economic and lofty ideas of job <laughs> creation. Um, so now the challenge against the ordinance would be slightly different from a legal perspective. Okay, so this is for anyone to jump in, but like I, when I look at this and and if I think I'm in favor of, you know, upping the restrictions, I think of a lot of benefits, right? I mean, the ironbound is only getting more expensive. I think from what I see, a lot of people moving out because of rent increases. Wouldn't this only, you know, sort of add to the market of, you know, marketable apartments and thus, you know, increase supply and drive down price? Or am I missing something here? Um, uh, yes, I think you are missing something respect respectively. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that argument is a very common one. It's a very market-based analysis of things uh, taken by a lot of folks in what's called the YIMBY movement, yes, in my backyard, as opposed to the more traditional not in my backyard. Um, but that has been proven false, so that when you add only, when you upzone, to allow on, and only allow market rate units, that actually drives up rent. There was actually a recent study out of Harvard um, looking at Chicago and an upzoning effort there. And then what was seen is that rents actually rise. So when you're adding supply, that can drive down rents, but you need to add supply at accessible to all incomes from your extremely low and very low incomes up to market rate. And Mayor Baraka, he even agreed at a community meeting before in uh, the end of November, he even admitted that this MX3 ordinance is going to raise property taxes and raise rents for uh, residents of the Ironbound. And even if you add affordable housing units, or like I think what they did with the Hain building, right, is they had like X amount of affordable housing <coughs> units. Even with that, you think it wouldn't help with you know, putting more apartments on the market at a reasonable um, rent? So there's a couple different things to that point. Uh, at the Haynes building, that 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 was the, they were included uh, affordable units because of the financing they involved in getting tax credits from the state of New Jersey. Um, so that does help some, but it's not enough. And then in the MX3 zone, Newark has something called inclusionary zoning, which means that 20% of the units need to be affordable, but that's only a small amount and it won't offset the overall impact. In addition... Just a quick question. at the So with 20% affordable units, is that at the building level? Like is it 20% of a building or is it just in the area they have to be So affordable? it's for individual projects. Mm -hmm. uh, inclusionary zoning says you need to make 20% affordable. And affordable is defined differently. Half of the 20% is up to 80% of the area median income, while 25% uh, is at 60%, and then 25% is at 40%. However, there's also no guarantee that the units will be built on site. Developers can ask instead to pay into an affordable housing trust fund that the city can use elsewhere, or uh, developers can ask to de develop affordable homes elsewhere in the city of Newark. In the entire city, not even the same ward. Or exactly. Oh, well. So um, there's no guarantee that you're going to get affordability, and even if you do get affordability, it's not going to serve uh, some of our most vulnerable participants, including in the area where MX3 is. That's right next to Penn Station, which is serves as the de facto largest homeless shelter in the state of New right. Jersey. We need to create homes for our most vulnerable populations and the lowest uh, incomes possible, too. Well, the, the other thing is, I mean, <clears throat> another major argument I've heard in favor of, of allowing for the greater height restrictions or allowing for taller buildings is that simply we have a massive transit hub, one of the largest, if not the largest in the state. Is it right not to, like, expand Newark's tax base and thus expand business in Newark by allowing for, you know, these mass, you know, these large buildings that can in, in bring in a lot of young professionals, a lot of people with a lot of disposable income next to a train station who otherwise wouldn't move to Newark. I mean, what's at stake if we don't allow for that kind of development? 
um, yeah. I, it's more than just height. Um, the ordinance, because it's a zoning ordinance, there are many other things that the city is basically missing out on a huge opportunity to uh, architect the future of this area of the city. And zoning ordinances have to do with setbacks in terms of how far away from the sidewalk can you build. Height, uh, it's renewable or sustainable building materials. Uh, open public spaces, as Drew said, the inclusionary zoning. Currently, the inclusionary zoning ordinance is crafted so that it's a lot more profitable for a developer just to pay into the fund than actually make the units on site. And so, therefore, it's highly unlikely that you would have any affordable units in any of these new projects. So, there's also, you know, given that the infrastructure of the city is so old and aging and decrepit and in major need of upgrade and repair. The city could require developers to make contributions into some kind of fund. There's none of that either. So for the people who are against the ordinance, it's not just about height. It's not just about 12 stories in a neighborhood where even though the previous zoning ordinance allowed for eight, if you walk around, most buildings aren't more than five. And then you were to put, like, essentially a, another building next to it, which is more than double that height. It's, it's just not appropriate for that neighborhood. But it's not just height. It's also about all the other missed opportunities that the city didn't seize upon in drafting this ordinance, which is going to shape the future of the city for generations. I mean, I'm probably asking this to the wrong crowd, but like it, I'm also thinking like, isn't this part of one of the reasons why we lost the Amazon bit? I mean, obviously, probably there's a lot of factors into it. And I'm, Amazon is just one example of businesses that have not come to Newark. But is that also not holding the city back? I mean, I understand we have this vision of the Ironbound as this like unique area of Newark that needs to be preserved. But at the same time, it's we're only talking about one section of it. And a very small section of it. Granted, it's the first one you see when you come out of Penn Station. But wouldn't it make sense, you know, if we really want to bring in a lot more money to be able to have, you know, the Ironbound be preserved in, with a sustainable economic future, wouldn't it make sense to allow for that kind of tall building? Well, or is there some, are we going to lose other things as well? Not to, not to dominate the yeah, conversation, yeah. but you can allow that in the Central Ward. There's plenty of empty lots that you, where you can build 12, 15, 20, 25 stories. Nobody's opposed to building height in the Central Ward. Just to be clear, Central Ward's huge, right? Yeah, when, but there's, where, plenty where? Of, there's plenty of empty lots right around Penn Station. Okay. So you're talking about near Penn Station. Yeah, near, yeah. Downtown. So, you know, it's it down the downtown area. There's plenty of development to be had there. And it's, you know, there's there's all this desire and rush to build in the Ironbound and to build high and and concentrate it and with upper densities that are just that the the community and the infrastructure just can't support. So it's, you know, our argument is to spread the wealth a little bit. So to make this a little more concrete, what is it that you guys fear? Like are there examples? in New Jersey or outside of New Jersey that like you can point to it and say, well, this is what could happen for better or for, or actually for worse if you want to, if you are against it. Well, one of the reasons I've been heavily involved and opposed to MX3 and the zoning changes is it's already difficult as is to commute into and out of Newark. The traffic is a big problem. Police, ambulance, um, the fire trucks, they have a hard time getting down the streets. Uh, this, with the schools, people dropping off their children. And so bringing in all of these excess development is o even overcrowding the the amount of people that's already in the neighborhood. Right. Forget about double parking. We'll get triple. <laughs> triple parking. parking. Right. It's hard to get around. It's It's very difficult to find anywhere to park the car. Normally, someone won't even leave their home because you can't find anywhere to park. And uh, one of the big issues, as already mentioned, the infrastructure is just not there. We have like two way, uh, two lane streets. It's not like it's four or five lanes where cars could get around easily. And so I think we would just be super over congested. There's an issue with flooding. I mean, that needs right. to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And then with the schools and people being able to drop off their, their children and the traffic as is, like when it's not traffic hour, takes at least a half an hour or more to get out of the neighborhood. Actually, so you brought up something that, like, always has bugged me, and I find it strange about Newark. So I don't think, I mean, Jersey City has this problem a little bit. New York definitely doesn't have to deal with this problem, but it's this idea of parking. 
And I think one of the things that comes up when we're discussing these, this building development is, you know, parking lots and building parking garages. And why is it that in Newark, and if you guys can enlighten me, like why is it that there's a, such a demand for parking, even if we're building near a transit hub? Um, in a way that there isn't that the same discussion in New York where they don't require parking garages when they build a new building. Or I think in Jersey City, they haven't been as forceful about that. Well, one of the things I uh, that I just think about is in terms of jobs, like there's not jobs in the city yet. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my work, I've always had to leave Newark to go somewhere else for work. And so I think that there's this idea that if we build there will be jobs and you know we can people will ride their bikes to work but we're not in this like space yet where people are riding bicycles to work and commuting and walking and so there's a heavy push i i, th I think in the development this mindset that if traffic becomes bad eventually people will ride their bike or not drive Right. But they're not considering that there is an issue with parking, that there's an issue with, you know, if someone is living in a in a two bedroom apartment, that there's like two or three people in there driving. Everyone has a car. Um, so I think there's this neglectful way of thinking that people will just get rid of their cars right. and it will become another Hoboken, Jersey City where people are commuting. And I don't think that's the case for our neighborhood necessarily right and to put a finer point on it um i think there's a weird like fetish around driving particularly in northern jersey where you know i think what's going on in harrison this is why reason why i asked the example question is because i keep thinking of harrison where i think a lot of people move there right thinking oh they, they visit on the weekend right this is the, i think what's going on and they don't see the stadium with a game on they don't see what it's like on a monday morning and they're like oh i can have my car here and commute into the city. So I keep wondering, and I and I realize I'm asking a crowd here that sees this as what's going to happen, but, you know, is it going to be the fact that, like, what will happen is people will still have their cars and commute on public transit to New York City, to Jersey City, wherever they're working? Well, the other problem with the Iron Banner in particular or the area around Penn Station is you have a lot of suburbanites coming in to Newark with their cars to take the train from Penn Station. And that's what the surface parking lots were feeding. They were feeding transit workers who would come in and leave and not spend any money, but only leave their garbage and their pollution in terms of the pollution of their cars with the fumes and their, you know, they weren't contributing to the economy. And the only people getting rich were the property owners who had the surface parking lots. So that's also what's very unique about Newark. And I don't know if it's because geographically or just in terms of um, socially how things developed here, but you have all the suburbanites coming in to park to go into the city. So we have a different population, you know, air quotes, that they're, they're just day workers who actually don't have anything yeah. to do with the city other than leaving their cars. Yeah, my... Uh, Sorry, Mom, if you're listening to this, but uh, my mom complains, and she, you know, she's lived in New York for, since you know, 80, 84, 85. I, I don't know what year it was. But you know, she refuses to come downtown now. Like, and I live downtown, and she's like, I'm not coming down there like anywhere near 5 p.m. Because she says it's impossible to get around. And, and I think that's something that a lot of people feel. Um, whether or not that'll get, that'll get better is a different issue. And, but, um, you know, it's... So we're basically predicting that, like, even if we build, you know, if we allow for the height restrictions, there still will be a lot of cars downtown and that won't deal with any of the congestion issues. At least you guys are arguing. Well, at least personally, yeah. I've had to change my work hours. Well, so how so? That, well, I just had to leave during a time where it wasn't traffic hour. So now I start work at 12 and my day ends at 8. So that just goes to show you that, like, the impact on someone's work I, there was no way that I could leave at 8.30, 8 in the morning anymore to be at work by 9. Sometimes it takes me literally up to an hour just to leave on that street, uh, Delancey and Stockton, because mm -hmm. it's all the way backed up with trucks, diesel trucks. Um, recently, I think they approved, and maybe Drew can speak a little bit more on this, um, uh, a whole lot area where diesel trucks will be parking overnight or for like connected to Port Nork. Mm -hmm. And so there's not really an it, the congestion, the traffic, you know, restructuring the roads. They're not really considering 
fixing those issues before like bringing on more people or more trucks you know so anyway i've I, had to change my work hours yeah. and i definitely avoid going anywhere downtown because one one time i was stuck um near penn station there was a pre a prudential concert happening and a game at red bulls and i couldn't get anywhere in the ironbound i was like stuck there for close to an hour as well right they when they close mulberry street yeah. all all hell breaks loose but i, I want to get to drew but just in a second because i think we've all been dancing around this issue of the vicious cycle I, I, I mean having grown up in newark you see this cycle play itself out over and over again <clears throat> we don't have the money to fix the roads therefore we need to attract businesses but we don't have the business coming in because the roads are so full of potholes and they look at newark and they're like why would i move my business here and so I guess, is this, is building the towers a way of getting out of that cycle? Like to come back to it, like if we want the cash flow to create the infrastructure, which, you know, we do get some money from the state and the federal government, um, but we don't, you know, if we really want to have that tax base on our own to spend, don't we need high rises with that, you know, property taxable income to bring in, as well as the, the money they put into businesses that then themselves get taxed, don't we need that all in order to get break from this cycle um yes but it's about how you do that and, and what the process looks like i think a lot of the issue or one of the big issues with uh this new mx3 ordinance was how it was done it was done behind closed doors mm -hmm. at city hall not in conversations with residents who are the most impacted those who are most impacted must lead, and there has to be some democratic processes to create uh, growth for our city, and there are ways to do that. There are areas downtown that right now, some of the skyscrapers that exist, they just host servers right now. So is that really the best use? Why not rehab those buildings, ha attract people there? Um, and overall, it's... Yes, about we need to increase rateables, but we also can do that by building wealth from within Newark and helping folks that are here now rise up, increase their incomes, rather than bringing folks from outside. Um, before you mentioned other places that have undertaken similar issues and you brought up Amazon. Well, look at Seattle, um, where Amazon's first headquarters were. That is a completely unaffordable place to live right now, too. So bringing in big corporations from the outside is not the answer. We need to grow from within and boost people's wealth here. Yeah, I know. Just a quick news update, by the way, not to bring this conversation back to Newark, but apparently New York City doesn't want Amazon. So Absolutely. who knows if we'll have that conversation again here. Newark doesn't want Amazon either. Well, I'm, yeah, well, some... Uh, to be fair, I think the, there's a split going on. How big the split is between the two sides, uh, I can't speak to, but I think there are some people, I definitely know some people who are very much in favor of having them come in. But I wanted to get to something that you mentioned, which was this behind closed doors thing. Now, from an outside perspective and a somewhat neutral perspective, as much as you might not like the idea of building these tall towers, they're not necessarily an overt bad, like a complete moral bad. Right. So th my question is, and I've heard this line thrown around about that this was done without democratic process. In fact, the lawsuit was about this very issue, as mo among other things. Um, why is it that this was done from behind closed doors as perceived by, you know, the people who are against it? What 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 is it that they're you would think they're trying to hide or not be so forthcoming about? Um, potentially the issues of a few individual landowners there's several there's about three or four big landowners in the mx3 zone that this is catering towards but if you look at the history of planning in newark um newark hadn't updated its zoning ordinance until 2015 and previously it was like 19 late 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 1950s is this the master plan we're talking about or the, the zoning ordinance yeah. and before that the master, master plan, plan. Okay. but the last zoning like brand new ordinance was in the late 50s Okay. And then, starting in around 1996, there was the Newark Master Plan Working Group that was created um, under the Sharp James administration, where uh, community residents and activists from across the city came together and started working on this. For a decade, this happened. Then, Cory Booker was elected mayor, 
and he decided, oh, I'm going to start my process over again. And so little by little, they did pass a new master plan in 2012. Then Corey decided to go run for the Senate. And so Mayor Barack, when he was elected in 2014, he actually and his staff realized how much community input had went into the master plan and the zoning ordinance. And they're like, okay, we're not going to start the process over again. We're going to respect the community and what was developed when countless, countless community meetings, I sent, I personally sat in many of them, um, and there was businesses were involved, uh, pro-development people, everyone was involved. It was a very inclusive process. And this new uh, ordinance was passed in uh, early 2015, and then all of a sudden, changes were happening behind closed doors. And then I think this MX3, the first time it popped up, I believe it was uh, the week of 4th of July. It was right around mm -hmm. the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so it was very suspicious to folks, too, and I think a lot has to do with... What, what, why is the 4th of July significant? It just being a major holiday. Oh, you mean like people were out of town? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. That's why, yeah. And I remember the second meeting was just around the time when school was starting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, you so think then it was difficult for anyone who has children or, you know, they're preparing to go back to school to come to the second planning meeting. And then when they brought it, when they brought back round two, it was they announced the public meetings about it the day before mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, and then the meeting was like the Monday after Thanksgiving. I want to say so. so there was a lot of process issues, mm -hmm. and just it, it caused a lot of anger and distrust in the com community. So you think the anger is not just solely <clears throat> an issue about the height restrictions purely, but also this idea of being left out of a conversation? Oh, certainly, mm -hmm. certainly. I mean, you know, you're you're. Uh, putting forth an ordinance that has drastic repercussions for the community and you don't involve them in any discussions before it's presented to the council. I mean, not, not a single, and all of the discussions or all of the community meetings were after the fact. They nope. weren't, the people weren't involved in the drafting. Their input was not taken into consideration. And, you know, all of the issues of the ordinance, again, it's not just about height. I want to make that very clear for at least my group, Plan Newark. It's not a height argument. But we weren't included before. We sued the city. We won. Then they, you know, they feign these conversations with us to ask us for our input. We have planners on our, um, you know, in our organization, very competent people, professionals with professional experience, not just community activists who don't know anything about planning principles. Not that that means, not, not that's a bad thing, but I mean, these were professionals with education and, exp and work experience. And, you know, we, we gave the city recommendations on how you could make this ordinance better for everyone. Not about saying, don't pass it again, but okay, here's an opportunity to make it better in round two. And except for the 20-story loophole, they didn't take any of our recommendations into consideration. And then the community meetings followed presentment to the council. So where is your community input? None. So, yeah, and I spent many days just flyering on the street, on nope. Ferry Street, going down um, New York Avenue, just being actively involved and letting residents know about what was going on because it was so kind of like it there was there was no it wasn't being promoted in like the newspaper they weren't discussing the meetings anywhere publicly so that residents knew that upcoming meetings to discuss the the zoning changes were coming up at like the Portuguese Sport Club and I think they had a um, maybe a meeting at the Ironbound Community yes like learning center but there, it was not like the community community didn't even know about the meeting. So a lot of us were involved, like just passing out flyers and letting people know that mm -hmm. there was going to be zoning changes happening in our neighborhood because people were clueless. Right. So I want to put a pin because I, I, we talked about compromise and I, I actually want to get there at one point. But there's something that like I think of myself as pretty politically astute and I can follow political things. I'm trying to figure out what... Augusto Omidor's, um position is on oh, this? Well, that's very, very curious because the first time he voted against the ordinance, right. which was, mind you, right before elections, and his constituency overwhelmingly was against MX3. Mm -hmm. And that's, this, the, that's the no vote that, at the, the October 2017, yes, right? When, yes, yeah. okay, yes. you know, a few months prior to right, his right, right, re-election. Right. Then you come around to round two, and he, you know, preaches from the pulpit 
oh, we've come a long way. There's lots of changes. And, you know, I was against this the first time, but I'm for the community and I'm making sure that this protects us. And so I'm voting yes. Well, I have news for you. There weren't any changes. So what changed with Amador? He's not facing re-election. And, you know, there's clearly, you know, him him voting no the first time was for appearances because the, everyone else on the council voted yes. So who cares that he voted no? I mean, he wasn't lobbying other people to vote with him. And, you know, it's for appearances for his constituency right before an election. And now he votes no. But there haven't been any changes. So, you know, call him on it. Yeah. What, what change that changed yeah. your vote? Yeah, so for our listeners who may not be as familiar with New York politics, um, Amador is the East Ward Councilman. He's been East Ward Councilman for over 20 years at this point? Too yep. long. 1998. <laughs> 98, okay, yes. And he goes by Augie sometimes. Um, yep. And I just want to make that clear just in case we're not talking to some random <clears throat> councilman. There's nine, nine of them? Nine. 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 Um, but this is like he is a very much the face, I mean, for better or for worse, of the uh, the Ironbound. And I, and I just wanted to ask that because I was really confused because I saw the no vote and then like an absent vote and then a yes vote. And I was trying to piece that all together and trying to figure out. I don't know if he's talked about this publicly and you seem to suggest that he has in the sense that this is a good for the Ironbound. At least he's arguing. So when, when we, again, for the listeners, Ironbound, East Ward, Down Neck, Ferry Street, these are all coterminous things for this same area. Um, but just to reiterate, he's for it because it's going to bring development to the Iron Mound at, as of this point? Or? I mean, his his reasons on the record at the council meeting weren't, weren't very articulate. <laughs> okay. So I don't know what his motivation is. All I can say is it's very suspect when you look at the timing of the votes. And, you know, him saying that I voted no, but now I'm voting yes because we've come a long way. And that's pretty much what he said and there's a lot of changes well there weren't changes except for the 20 story 20 story down you know from 20 to 12 so uh, is eight stories would change your vote councilman you know thank you very much right so the last thing i want to get to with this discussion is the the compromise position because i i feel th- in my own predictions that this is going forward pretty much i mean there will be lawsuits obviously and there will be um political pushback but in an ideal world where, you know, both sides have leverage, the community and the pro-development side, what is the compromise position where you still lose, you know, some of the height restrictions? But, like, what is it that you would want in return, whether it's something to deal with the height restrictions themselves or something, some other promise that has to be actually actuated and effectuated? Like, is there a compromise position that you guys see in an ideal world? I think during the second go-round of MX3, what a lot of us talked about in community meetings when we're trying to push for is 10 stories, which Mm -hmm. is right in the middle between the 12 stories proposed under MX3 that passed and eight stories, which was existing. I think that's one great thing. And then also, I would say mandatory uh, inclusionary units on site, not, not being allowed to pay into a trust fund or develop elsewhere, and then some sort of impact fee to address the infrastructure issues too. Um, our sewers are very outdated. There's lead yeah. in our water. So, so we hear. <laughs> um, and then the traffic issues that Lisa and Lillian so articulately spoke about, too. I mean, so. One other thing to remember about this is, you know, this doesn't preclude a, a builder to go before the Zoning Board of Adjustment and ask for even greater height. So they could go before the zoning board and get a variance for 15 stories or 20 stories, whatever the zoning board wants to grant them. And the history of the zoning board is they give out variances like candy. They don't deny applications hardly ever. So, you know, this is not t- saying like no, no building whatsoever in the city will ever be more than 12 stories. No, there's mm-hmm. always that possibility under the municipal land use law that they could go before a zoning board of adjustment and get variances for different things. So, so actually, a quick question. I just want to make things clear. So we have a separate vo- zoning board in Newark, right? Uh, every municipality does. That's, okay. Yeah. And, and it's separate because I feel like I've only ever been to city council meetings about variances or like ordinances to do that. But there is a first stop where you would go and then you would appeal, I guess, to the city council to get a higher restriction from that, right? Or Yes. I mean, it's mandatory. There's a planning board yeah. as well as a zoning board. Okay. If you want to do extraordinary things and go outside the existing zoning then it has to go to the zoning board and historically at both the planning and zoning boards um 
variances are granted very easily. Right. Yeah, which is a shame and uh, is an issue that we need to work on moving forward. Yeah. The also the, another you know missed opportunity is that the um, actual like design of the buildings you're allowed to have mm-hmm. first floor parking. So instead of having an active street level building with storefronts or residents, you're going to just create high rises with parking on the first and second floors, which would be more parking spaces than currently actually even exist because they can do the entire footprint parking plus another story on top of that. So that's another thing with the ordinance that the residents, or at least Plan Newark, is furious over is that, you know, you're not getting rid of parking here. When you when and you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth here. Transit oriented means no cars. So why are you doing transit oriented development with an allowance for two full floors of parking? It, it makes no sense. Right, and I think one of the ironies not to jump in too much, but and, and for full disclosure, um, I do not have a driver's license. Don't make fun of me. Um, but it's it's on a map. 280 and the Garden State Parkway look close, <laughs> but they actually aren't to the Ironbound, right? Like, I'm a, dri- the drivers here, please speak. <laughs> like, it's even if you do put parking there, you, there's still like you have to go out of the way to get to those. I mean, th- maybe the 21 and the and the Turnpike are easier, but like to get to 280, it's it's still a, no, a it's hike. Right. I mean, yes and no. I don't. It's right in Harrison, so yeah. I guess you have to cross. But the problem with Harrison is now we have. Harrison's also that should be a future discussion podcast. Uh, um, but Harrison has its own issues, right? Because they only have one street coming in and out, which is Frankie Rogers. Um, but yeah, yeah. And then it's kind of interesting you mentioned that, like that still allows for first floor parking, at least mm-hmm. the way it's construct construed right now. Yeah, the des- um, the the design of the ordinance yeah. allows for that. Yes. Um, Lillian, do you have any comments? Well, what I was gonna. I was just going to add one of the things that we didn't really discuss is even how like small businesses are impacted mom and pop stores. Um, I think when all of these changes start happening very quickly and I've been seeing a lot of development, you know, starting to go up at the end towards like down neck, um, down ferry where like the old path mark, the Wells Fargo is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's labeled as luxury development. And so all of these developments that are coming and being marketed towards like a specific type of person. And then like I'm walking down like Ferry Street or any other block and wondering, okay, who can afford these places? And so as development starts going up and taxes increase, I remember there was, I'm not sure like the specific year, maybe it was like 2010 when taxes increased and there was a lot of businesses that closed down. A lot of restaurants weren't able to make the tax jump. And so I'm always thinking about if these developments come into our neighborhood and there's like a huge tax hike, everyone who's been here for like 15, 20 years owning businesses or who's lived here for a long time, mostly Mm -hmm. like middle income, low income, residents like how can they afford the tax hikes like how can they how will their businesses stay open and then we talk about these um like on the first two like floors if there's parking lots and there's not really some plan to consider like these uh small businesses that have been here a long time like they're just going to close and go off somewhere else and and then we start losing the culture of our community and like what our community actually represents because the or the businesses that have been here a long time can no longer afford right. to be here. Well, I, and to, to get to sort of the ends of this conversation, I, I, this is kind of an interesting point and not to run with this pun, but like, I feel like the train may have left the station already. I mean, my grandmother, you know, rest in peace. I don't think she would recognize Ferry Street at this point. I mean, just to think of what's gone already. Uh, Riviera is gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, pastry shop just closed up. I just noticed walking by there. Um, Adega's remodeling, whatever that means. Um, you know, is it, you know, this is the story. I mean, this is a larger story about the Ironbound. I mean, it, you know, once it was an English speaking community, then it became a German speaking community, then a Polish oh, one, sure. then a Portuguese one, right? And now it's, I think, Ecuadorian and Salvadorans now at this mm-hmm. point. And, isn't that the story of the Ironbound? And hasn't the train train left the station at this point? You know, it's completely different, right? And and maybe that's the beauty of the Ironbound is it's so malleable, and that like even adding these buildings wouldn't really change much because 
what we're chasing is gone already, right? And, and you can push back if you want on this point, but like, you know, what's the point if everything, like everything's pretty much changed in the Ironbound at this point. It's not what it was. And maybe we're chasing a dream here that, you know, is not a dream. It's no longer a dream. We've woken up at this point. Change, yes. And change is good. It's not a bad thing. But what's been true throughout the generations and the changing cultures and ethnicities in Ironbound, I think, is that it's still been locally owned businesses. I think what we don't want to see is it becoming corporate. Mm -hmm. I think Hoboken is kind of what we don't want to see Ironbound become. And there are business owners and some of the folks involved with the Ironbound Business Improvement District and developers, they want to see, see Ironbound turn into Hoboken. But Hoboken is completely unrecognizable. I have uh, friends and coworkers who grew up there and they're like, I can't even go back there because it's too painful to see how different it is too. Right. Yeah. I think one of the best stories, or not stories, the best ways to describe <coughs> the Ironbound is when you talked about the corporization, is that for years there was a Burger King that basically couldn't survive and closed up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was a, sort of the spirit of the Ironbound was like they would never do a fast food restaurant. And now there's a McDonald's that's actually pretty thriving yeah. <laughs> in the center of the Ferry Street. And it's kind of weird to see that because that was so, like, we had Wal, you know, we had not the Walgreens, but uh, well, yeah, Walgreens, Walgreens and, and the um, Rite, Aid. Rite Aid, right? But that was different. That's like a yeah. But now we have a Seven Eleven right, right well, at the corner yeah. of the most <laughs> one of the most like prime spots yeah. of real estate. Beautiful the building. entrance yeah. to Should the Iron Bound yeah. is like a Seven Eleven. No, not not to reveal my cards too much, but I really you know believe that should be a cocktail bar or a restaurant. It's really weird to see it as a Seven Eleven that plays art gallery that yeah. Pla yeah. that plays a really loud. Um, Classical music, I don't know if you guys have heard this walking by. If you visit Newark, walk outside Penn Station and go by the 7-Eleven. They play really loud classical music outside the, the speaker. If you guys ever walk by, I don't know if it's Blink or 7-Eleven. It's probably Blink that's mm. doing it. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's one of the biggest issues, I think, as development starts to occur. People who own small businesses cannot afford running their business here anymore. And it's been like that actually for a few years where if you walk down Ferry Street, most of the, the stores are like 99 cent stores. Um, right. Some have already been like purchased by corporations. And being a city, yes, I'm used to changes. I grew up here and every couple uh, years, there's a whole influx of people and different businesses. But Soon we won't be able to afford to have a bit, you know, you can't afford to have a business because rents are increasing, taxes are increasing, and there's not, you know, I don't know what ordinance would include this or not, but there's not being any consideration on how do we protect our art galleries, how do we protect the businesses that have been here, how do we um, make an agreement with developers that they have to include, you know, that space to be for the community. And so there's a there's a lot of opportunities being missed in the planning of how to protect a community and add culture and add like um, like social life to the people who live there. And as you mentioned, that like 7-Eleven, as soon as you walk out of Penn Station, mm -hmm. you know, I was really excited about this the the building opening up and that it's finally being active and it's activated and yes that's exciting but how does it really add to our community in any way and so it just becomes where i think we're headed in a in like the systemic place where it's just like all corporations on ferry and like it doesn't make right. the the community special right you know and and ironbound is known for its restaurants or for the culture. And, th and that's what makes the, the community unique. And it's, if we don't protect that, then that's no longer there. And that's how do you protect certain buildings or how do you protect certain spaces that have been like the center, the heart of what has made or what Nork is known for, for, for a long time, 30, mm -hmm. 40 years, you know? so. That's not being considered, and I think that part of my reason for being very active and, and vocal and, you know, on the streets, like, flyering and talking to people, asking them if they know what's going on is because I, it's really important, I think, for us to protect the culture of a specific city or how we protect um, making sure that anyone can own a business locally and that it's, like, mom and pop. And because eventually, 
And these developments just push everyone out from having any access to renting or running a business. So the compromise for me would be as the development starts to, you know, get passed that there's ordinances or variances. I'm not sure how it's actually referred to, but it's written in that it has to be inclusive or like there's a certain rent cap or something that way it it can include and protect the businesses that are currently in the city or like slowly. I mean, of course, prices, you know, living rents go up, but when it goes up to so quickly, people can't be there. Right. The story of the Ironbound changed, but not yet. <laughs> so um, I want to go around. I want to end the podcast on um, a light note where people can share what they're excited about in Newark and something that, or something they're happy about. And I think we'll start with uh, Drew here and we'll go around just like, you know, share something that, you know, you want to, you know, promote or something that you feel is really good that's going on. Um, so I think that I personally, I love winter and I like the cold weather, but I also am a little excited for the springtime and the summertime when there's just so many great events happening outside in Newark. One of my favorite places to go is Newark Riverfront Park, uh, right by the Orange Sticks. It's an awesome, awesome outdoor space with outdoor music and uh, movies, etc., as well as uh, Down Bottom Farms, another great outdoor space with farmers markets and concerts as well. And then, personally, I love the fight that's going to continue on the issues that we started talking about today to ensure development without displacement. Let people who have been in Newark for a long time, for all their lives, get to enjoy all these new amazing assets that are here in Newark. Yeah, from now on, I'm only going to call that park Orange Sticks. By the way. That's what it's known by, <laughs> the Orange Sticks. <laughs> um, um, I'm excited to have uh, Mulberry Commons. Uh, open up, um, turning that, you know, um, sea of asphalt into a public space and a park, um, and the development that's going on in that area, you know, with Ironside, uh, the other developments that are slated to, um, you know, come in the next few years and to really activate that downtown area by the arena. Uh, and I'm excited about all the urban farms that have been opening up. You mentioned mm -hmm. Down Bottom Farms. I love seeing spaces activated in that way and working with the youth so that they can cultivate food and be involved in their communities. And I love that how that's been shifting quite a bit. Well, thank you. That's it for this episode. I would like to thank our guests, um, Drew, Lisa, and Lillian. Um, this is Manny Antunes, host and producer of the podcast, uh, Pot and Market podcast, editing and sound engineering by Bahid Frazier. Uh, podcast logo and design provided by Robert Conti. Additional creative input by Samantha Cates. If you have a subject you would like to hear discussed on the podcast, please email podandmarket at gmail.com or contact the pod through social media. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And I would like to end with a quote uh, by William Carlos Williams, this amazing poet from Patterson, New Jersey. And this is actually from his mm -hmm. collection of poet, uh, poetry called Patterson. A man in himself is a city beginning, seeking, and achieving and concluding his life in ways which the various aspects of a city may embody. Thank you.